please support this channel by clicking on the links below. Signs and Symbols in 12 Lectures by George Oliver. Lecture 9, On the Point, Within a Circle. But though past all diffused without a shore, his essence local is his throne as meat. To gather the dispersed as standards call, then listed from afar to fix a point, a central point, collective of his sons, since finite every nature but his own. If Earth's whole orb by some dire distant eye were seen at once, her towering Alps would sink, and leveled at last leave an even sphere. Thus Earth and all that earthly minds admire is swallowed in eternity's vast round. Young The progress of error is rapid and uniform when the restraints imposed on man's depravity by a pure and peaceable religion are exchanged for the wild dreams and enthusiastic figments of human invention and like a spherical body precipitated with violence from the summit of an inclined plane acquires additional force and velocity at every revolution until its progress is irresistible. An illustration of this principle will be contained in the present lecture on that most important emblem of masonry, a point within a circle. Whether we regard this symbol in the purity of its legitimate interpretation or consider the unlimited corruption which it sustained in its progress through the mysteries of idolatry, the general principle will be found equally significant. It was originally the conservator of a genuine moral precept founded on a fundamental religious truth, but innovation followed innovation until this degraded symbol became the dreadful depository of obscenity and lust. The use of this emblem is coeval with the first created man, a primary idea which would suggest itself to the mind of Adam when engaged in reflections on his own situation, the form of the universe, and the nature of all the objects presented to his view, would be that the creation was a circle and himself the center. This figure, implanted without an effort, would be ever present in all his contemplations and would influence his judgment to a certain extent while attempting to decide on the mysterious phenomena which were continually before him. To persons unacquainted with the intricate philosophy of nature, as we may fairly presume Adam was, this is the plain idea conveyed to the senses by a superficial view of nature's works. Ask an unlettered hind of the present day, and he will tell you that the earth is a circular plane and perhaps he will have some indistinct notion that the expanse above his head is spherical. But he will assuredly look upon himself as the common center of all. This is consistent with the general appearance of things, for if he look around, he finds the horizon, unless intercepted by the intervention of sensible objects, equally distant from the point of vision in all its parts and the experiment uniformly producing the same results whether made by night or day, he relies on the evidence of his senses and pronounces his own judgment correct and irrefutable. So the first created man, himself the center of the system, he would regard paradise as the limit of the habitable earth and the expanse as the eternal residence of the omnipresent deity. A little reflection, however, would soon bring him nearer to the truth. The Garden of Eden was of a circular form, and the Tree of Life was placed in the center. Now, as the fruit of this tree was reputed to convey the privilege of immortality, the center would hence be esteemed the most honorable situation, 
and be ultimately assigned to the deity, who alone enjoys the attributes of immortality and eternity. For Adam, in his progress to different parts of this happy abode, would soon conclude that, however he might be deceived by appearances, he himself could not be a permanent center because he was constantly changing his position. To this august circle, the two forbidden trees were the accompanying perpendicular parallel lines, pointing out God's equal justice and mercy. Footnote Bishop Newcomb, in his notes on the prophet Ezekiel, gives an exemplification of these perpendicular parallel lines. In that prophet's description of the cherubim, the following passage occurs. They turned not when they went, they went every one straight forward. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 9. On which the learned prelate thus remarks, The wheels and horses of chariots bend and make a circuit in turning. But this divine machine, actuated by one spirit, moved uniformly together. The same line being always preserved between the corresponding cherubs and wheels, the sides of the rectangle limiting the whole, being always parallel, and the same faces of each cherub always looking onward in the same direction with the face of the charioteer. This proceeding directly on, in the same undeviating, inflexible position, seems to show their steadiness in performing the divine will which advances to its destined goal right onwards. And again, verse 17, the axis of the former wheels was always parallel to that of the latter. The wheels are supposed to express the revolutions of God's providence, which are regular, though they appear intricate. End of footnote. When Adam had violated the divine command and eaten of the tree of knowledge, justice demanded that the threatened penalty should be paid. But here mercy interposed, and he was expelled from the abode of purity and peace, now violated by transgression, lest he should put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and live forever in a state of wickedness and sin. Hence arose the Masonic emblem of a point within a circle. This emblem, united with the Masonic ladder, was reduced to practice very soon after the universal deluge and made the basis of a stupendous design which was intended to render man independent of his God and prevent the misery of being dispersed and scattered abroad in private companies over the face of the earth. In a former publication, I quoted a passage from Northwick's Constitutions, which assigns a square form to the celebrated Tower of Babel. But on more mature consideration, I am inclined to think that this opinion is erroneous. The first huts built for the habitation of man are supposed by Vitruvius to have been erected on a circular base as we know the cabins of the primitive Britons were, with a post in the center to support the roof. This disposition is in perfect accordance with the principle referred to above, and the form might not sustain any material alteration before the flood. For the first colonizers of every country, after the dispersion, used with one consent the same plan in the construction of their domestic edifices. The Tower of Babel may be supposed, therefore, to have partaken of this figure, not only from common usage, but also from its similarity to the spiral flame. For it was dedicated to the sun, as the great agent, according to the belief of these impious architects, employed in drying up the waters of the deluge. Verstigen has given a plate of this edifice in the title page to his Restitution of Decayed Intelligence in Antiquities, 
and it is there represented as the frustrum of a cone with seven gradations. Kalmit has followed this author and has given also an engraving with the same design, and indeed this was the most convenient form for the construction of such a stupendous work. According to Verstigen, the passage to Mount was very wide and great and went winding about on the outside, the middle and inward part for the more strength being all massive, and by cart, camels, dromedaries, horses, asses, and mules, the carriages were borne and drawn up, and by the way were many lodgings and hostelries, both for man and beast. And some authors report the space for going up to have been so exceeding wide that there were fields made all along besides the common passage or highway for the nurture of cattle and bringing forth of grain. But however it were, an almost incredible great work may it well be thought to have been. Here then we have a superb specimen of the point within a circle, supporting the seven-step ladder, delineated in characters which cannot be mistaken, acknowledged by the whole race of men, and occupying their united and undivided energies to confer upon it the indisputable qualities of magnificence and durability. The primitive explanation of this mysterious emblem among the Gentiles did not widely differ from the elucidation still used in the lectures of masonry. The circle referred to eternity and the central point to time to show that time was only a point compared with eternity and equidistant from all parts of its infinitely extended circumference. Because eternity occupied the same indefinite space before the creation of the world in which we live, as it will do when this world is reduced to its primitive nothing. When mankind had transferred their adoration from the Creator to His works, they advanced specious reasons to justify a devotion to spheres and circles, everything great and sublime which was continually presented to their inspection partook of this form. The sun, the unequivocal source of light and heat, was a primary object of attention and became their chief deity. The earth, the planets, and fixed stars proceeding in all their majestic regularity exceeded admiration and implanted devout feelings in their hearts. These were all spherical, as was also the ark of heaven, illuminated with their unfading luster. The next progressive observations of mankind would be extended to the unassisted efforts of nature in the production of plants and trees, and these were found to exhibit, for the most part, the same uniform appearances, from the simple stalk of corn to the bowl of the gigantic lord of the forest. The cylinder and cone, and consequently the circle, were the most common forms assumed by the vegetable creation. Every fruit he plucked, Every root he dug from the earth for food was either globular, cylindrical, or conical, each partaking of the nature of a circle. If a tree were divided horizontally, this section uniformly exhibited the appearance of a point within a succession of concentric circles. The same will be true of an onion, a carrot, and many other vegetables. Similar results would be produced from an inspection of animal bodies. The trunk is a cylinder, and the intestines, so often critically examined for the purposes of augury, presented to the curious inquirer little variation from the general principle. Hence, statues bearing these forms were subsequently dedicated to the Olympic gods, a cylinder to the earth and a cone to the sun. In this figure, Nature, in her most sportive mood, appeared exclusively to delight. If a bubble were excited on the water, it was spherical, and if any solid body were cast upon the surface, the ripple formed itself 
into innumerable concentric circles rapidly succeeding each other, of which the body or moving cause was the common center. If water were cast into the air, they found that the drops invariably arranged themselves into a globular form. This uniformity was seen, observed, and thought to be preternatural indication of divinity. For if nature assumed one unvarying character in all her works, that character must be an unquestionable symbol of the God of nature. Hence, the circle with its center distinctly marked became a most sacred emblem with every nation of idolaters, adopted perhaps from the same symbol used by their forefathers on the plain of China, referring primarily to the immeasurable expanse occupied by infinite space, a proper type of eternity, but now justified by a reference to the works of nature. This was the general belief, though the expression varied in different ages and amongst the inhabitants of different nations. The tribes contiguous to Judah placed a yod in the center of a circle as a symbol of the deity surrounded by eternity, of which he was said to be the inscrutable author, the ornament, and the support. The Samothracians had a great veneration for the circle, which they considered as consecrated by the universal presence of the deity, and hence rings were distributed to the initiated as amulets possessed of the power of averting danger. The Chinese used a symbol which bore a great resemblance to that which is the subject of this lecture. The circle was bounded north and south by two serpents, equivalent to the two perpendicular parallel lines of the Masonic symbol, and was emblematical of the universe protected and supported equally by the power and wisdom of the Creator. The Hindus believed that the Supreme Being was correctly represented by a perfect square, without beginning and without end. The first settlers in Egypt transmitted to their posterity an exact copy of our point within a circle, expressed in emblematical language. The widely extended universe was represented as a circle of boundless light in the center of which the deity was said to dwell, or in other words, the circle was symbolical of his eternity, and the perpendicular parallel lines by which it is bounded were the two great luminaries of heaven, the sun and moon, the former denoting his virtue, the latter his wisdom. And this idea was generally expressed by a hawk's head in the center of a circle or an endless serpent enclosing an eye. But the most expressive symbol to this effect, used by any people who had renounced the true religion, was the famous emblem of Pythagoras, who contrived not only to express the only one God residing in the midst of eternity, but united with it an idea of the divine triad and blended emblems of regeneration, morality, and science. For this purpose, he added to the central yard nine other yards disposed about the center in the form of an equilateral triangle, each side consisting of the number four. The disciples of Pythagoras denominated this symbol Trigonomisticum because it was the conservator of many awful and important truths. 1. The monad or active principle. 2. The duad or passive principle. 3. The triad or world proceeding from their union. 4. A sacred quaternary involving the liberal sciences, physics, morality, On this remarkable emblem, a full explanation may be equally interesting and instructive. The symbol of all things, according to Pythagoras, was one and two. One added to two make three. And once the square of two make four, which is the perfect tactrictus, and one plus two plus three plus four equals ten. 
the consummation of all things, and therefore the amount of the points contained within the Pythagorean circle is exactly 10. Hence, because the first four digits added into each other make up the number 10, this philosopher called the number 4 all number or the whole number and used it as the symbol of universality. To ascertain, however, the entire meaning of this symbol, it will be necessary to take the numbers included within the circle in their natural order and hear what hidden mystery the philosophy of Pythagoras attached to each. The number one was the point within the circle and denoted the central fire or God because it is the beginning and ending, the first and the last. It signified also love, concord, piety, and friendship because it is so connected that it cannot be divided into parts. Two, meant darkness, fortitude, harmony, and justice because of its equal parts, and the moon because she is forked. Three, referred to harmony, friendship, peace, concord, and temperance. All these and many other virtues depended on this number and proceeded from it. Four referred to the deity, for it was considered the number of numbers. It is the first solid figure, a point being one, a line two, a superficies three, and a solid four. It was also the tetrax, a word sacred among the Pythagoreans and used as a most solemn oath because they considered it the root and principle, the cause and maker of all things. Footnote. The sum of all the principles of Pythagoras is this. The monad is the principle of all things. From the monad came the indeterminate duad, as matter subjected to the cause monad. From the monad and the indeterminate duad numbers, from numbers points, from points lines, from lines superficies, from superficies solids, from these solid bodies whose elements are four, fire, water, air, earth of all which transmutated and totally changed, the world consists. End of footnote. Plutarch interprets this word differently. He says it is called the world and therefore refers to the number 36, which consists of the first four odd numbers added into the first four even ones. Thus, 1 plus 2 equals 3, 3 plus 4 equals 7, 5 plus 6, 11, 7 plus 8 equals 15, 36. The Tetractress of Pythagoras, however, was doubtless represented by the number 4 because this was the number of perfection, the divine mind, the image of God, and the Tetractus was no other than the glorious tetragrammaton of the Jews. The number five was light, nature, marriage. Six, health. Seven was said to be worthy of veneration because it referred to the creation of the world. Eight was the first cube and signified friendship, counsel, prudence, and justice. Nine was called Telios, because a perfect human being undergoes nine months gestation in the womb, and ten was denominated heaven because it was the perfection of all things. Footnote. The Druids applied this number to the elements. Five elements they are, that is to say earth, water, fire, air, and the heavens. And out of the four, first comes every inanimate matter, and out of the heaven, God, and all of live and living. And from the conjunction of these five came all things, or animate or inanimate they be. In the footnote. The point 
within the circle afterwards became a universal emblem to denote the temple of the deity and was referred to the planetary circle in the center of which was fixed the sun as the universal God and father of nature for the whole circle of heaven was called God. Pythagoras esteemed the central fire the supernal mansion of Jove and he called it because the most excellent body ought to have the most excellent place, i.e. the center. And Servius tells us it was believed that the center of a temple was the peculiar residence of the deity, the external decorations being merely ornamental. Hence, the astronomical character used to denote or represent the sun is a point within a circle, because that figure is the symbol of perfection. The most perfect metal, gold, is also designated in chemistry by the same character. With this reference, the point within a circle was an emblem of great importance amongst the British Druids. Their temples were circular, many of them with a single stone erected in the center. Their solemn processions were all arranged in the same form. Their weapons of war, the circular shield with a central boss, the sphere with a hollow globe at its end. All partaking of this general principle, and without a circle, it was thought impossible to obtain the favor of the gods. The rites of divination could not be securely and successfully performed unless the operator were protected within the consecrated periphery of a magical circle. The plant for vain was supposed to possess the virtue of preventing the effects of fascination. If gathered ritually, with an iron instrument at the rising of the dog star, accompanied with the essential ceremony of describing a circle on the turf, the circumference of which shall be equally distant from the plant before it be taken up. Specimens of British temples founded on the principle of a point within a circle are still in existence to demonstrate the truth of the theory. There are in Pembrokeshire, several circular stone monuments, but the most remarkable is that which is called Gromlech in Nevern Parish, where are several rude stones pitched on end in a circular order, and in the midst of the circle a vast rude stone placed on several pillars. Near Keswick in Cumberland is another specimen of this druidical symbol. On a hill stands a circle of 40 blocks of stone placed perpendicularly of about 5 feet and a half in height and one stone in the center of greater altitude. But the most stupendous circle temples were those of Stonehenge and Abury, the latter being 3 miles in length. The body of the temple at Clasherness in the island of Lewis sacred to the sun and the elements, will also illustrate the principle before us. This curious Celtic temple was constructed on geometrical and astronomical principles in the form of a cross and a circle. The circle consisted of 12 upright stones, in allusion to the solar year or the 12 signs of the zodiac. The east, west, and south are marked by three stones each, placed with the circle in direct lines pointing to each of those quarters, and towards the north is a double row of twice nineteen stones, forming two perpendicular parallel lines with a single elevated stone at the entrance. In the center of the circle stands, high exalted above the rest, the gigantic representative of the deity, to which the adoration of his worshippers was partic peculiarly directed. This extraordinary symbol was also used by the ancient inhabitants of Scandinavia and had an undoubted reference to the Hall of Odin or the Zodiac which the Edda informs us contained twelve seats disposed in the form of a circle for the principal gods besides an elevated throne in the center for Odin as the representative of the Great Father. One important purpose to which the circular monuments of this people were appropriated was 
the election of the Gothic sovereign chieftains. They were usually composed of 12 unhewn stones placed on end in a circular form, with one taller and more massive than the rest, pitched in the center as a seat or throne for the object of their choice. The upper surface of these stones was usually flat and broad, for it was from thence that the Jordis or priests harangued the people congregated around the enclosure on the comparative merits of the respective candidates for this exalted office. The suffrages being taken, the fortunate chieftain was elevated on high and publicly exalted to the view of his assembled subjects. This was the probable origin of our custom of chairing newly elected members of parliament. Three of these rude monuments remain to this day, one near London in Scania, another at Lethra in Zealand, and a third near Verberg in Jutland. It is remarkable that in all the ancient systems of mythology, the great father or the male generative principle was uniformly symbolized by a point within a circle. This emblem was placed by the Scandinavian priests and poets on the central summit of a rainbow, which was fabled to be a bridge leading from earth to heaven. The emblem therefore represented Valhalla, or the supernal palace of the chief celestial deity. It is said in the Edda that this bridge is all on fire, for the giants of the mountains would climb up to heaven by it if it were easy for everyone to walk over it. The palace thus elevated was no other than the celestial system illuminated by a central sun, whose representative on earth was Thor, a god depicted by Verstegan with a crowned head placed in the center of twelve bright stars, expressive of the sun's annual course through the zodiacal signs. But, however, this emblem might have a general reference to the deity or his temples. In the later ages of idolatry, it bore a more immediate relation to the generative principle of nature, symbolized by the union of the sexes. I am ashamed to stain my page with the discussion with this part of my subject necessarily introduces. But it cannot be wholly avoided as the point within a circle with an unequivocal allusion to the phallic worship, was the principal object of devotion with every people in the world. In India, the aditam, or most holy place in the temples of the deity, always contained the linga or phallus, which had a prominent situation assigned to it. Among the innumerable emblems which the walls were covered. In Egypt, the same practice was observed. Belzoni says of the temple at Tentra, the shafts of the columns are covered with hieroglyphics and figures in the front and lateral walls. On all the walls, columns, ceilings, or architraves, there is no where a space of two feet that is not covered with some figures of human beings, animals, plants, emblems, of agriculture or of religious ceremony. Amongst these, the phallus is a conspicuous emblem. The places of initiation in Chaldea were precisely of the same nature. Ezekiel thus describes them. The Spirit of God brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold, the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, and abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. In Greece, the phallus was an universal amulet. It was thought to prevent every species of calamity and was accordingly hung at the doors of houses, offices, and workshops. It was visible in every situation and was even suspended from the necks of children to preserve them 
from the effects of fascination. The same indecencies, says Faber, were practiced in the rites of the Kabiric series, as in those of Bacchus, Osiris, and Mahadeva. Her deluded votaries vied with each other in a studied obscenity of language, and her nocturnal orgies were contaminated with the grossest lasciviousness. And Diodorus, the Sicilian, says that such language was used under the impression that it was pleasing and acceptable to the goddess. Even the Israelites themselves were not entirely free from the contamination of such abominable practices, for the linga of the Hindus and the phallus and the priapus of the Greeks and Romans and the Baal Peor of the idolatrous Israelites was one and the same monstrous emblem, which was equally represented by a point within a circle. Jerome says that the idols worshipped by the latter were most of them dedicated to Baal Peor, who was portrayed in a gross and indecent attitude. Danique Interpretur Belfiajur Idalum Tentigenis Habens in Ore Id est Cemente Pelum Ut Terpidinum Membri Virilis Ostenderet. This deity was chiefly honored by female votaries. The good king Asa saw and lamented the widespread abomination, which was even practiced under the regal sanction. For his mother, Macha, had herself actually erected an altar to this unnatural divinity. This worship was the last and lowest stage of human debasement and evinces the strict propriety of those scripture phrases which refer to the universal depravity of mankind when given up to the defilements of idolatry. Mr. Maurice thinks this disgraceful emblem was derived from Egypt, for Diodorus deduces its origin from the search instituted by Isis for the body of her husband, which had been divided by Typhon into 14 parts and distributed over the face of the whole earth. For a long time, the disconsolate widow could not succeed in finding the genitals of her dismembered husband which had been committed to the waters of the Nile by his murderer. Being at length discovered, they were buried with great solemnity, and a commemorative festival was instituted, in which long poles with figures of this emblem attached to the summit were carried about in procession, and a legend to the same purpose was recited during the initiations. Captain Wilford gives another account of its origin. This gentleman says it was believed in India that at the general deluge everything was involved in the common destruction except the male and female principles or organs of generation which were destined to produce a new race and to repeople the earth when the waters had subsided from its surface. The female principle symbolized by the moon assumed the form of a lunette or crescent while the male principle, symbolized by the sun, assuming the form of the linga, placed himself erect in the center of the lunette, like the mast of the ship. The two principles in this united form floated on the surface of the waters during the period of their prevalence on the earth, and thus became the progenitors of a new race of men. Hence, they were received as objects of adoration under the imposing names of the Great Father and Mother of Mankind. And the acknowledged symbol of this mysterious union was a point within a circle. The true origin of this infamous worship may, perhaps, be more correctly derived from the sin of Ham who discovered and exposed his father's nakedness and the use of the degrading symbol might proceed from the curse inflicted on his posterity, who were thus reduced below the level of their species. Such were the absurd and dangerous systems founded, however, in truth, 
which deformed the religion of heathen nations and degraded celestial reason to a level with brutal instinct. To the true Mason, on the contrary, this emblem points out the most useful and invaluable lessons, and while he keeps his wishes and hopes bounded by the rules and ordinances of the sacred code, he may be assured that his character will be venerated amongst men, and the fragrance of his virtue will ascend to the throne of his father, who is in heaven like an evening sacrifice. And when the shades of age and imbecility shall have damped those energies which were once employed in the ardor of active virtue, his declining strength shall be cheered by the retrospect of what his benevolence affected while health and vigor remained, and by the prospect of the bright reward which lies before him. And while he considers this life but as the very beginning of his existence, he looks forward to that smiling world he is about to enter, and anticipates with inexpressible gratification the cheering welcome he will receive from saints and angels and the spirits of just men made perfect. If you would enjoy such happy anticipations when advanced in years and your bosom is becoming dead to the fascinations of life, you must circumscribe your thoughts and actions by the instruction of this significant emblem. Even your reputation amongst mankind is principally dependent on the rectitude of your moral conduct. If you wish for the commendation of the wise and good, and what is still of greater importance, the favorable testimony of your conscience, you must be honest and true, faithful and sincere, and practice all the virtues enjoyed equally by masonry and Christianity. You must keep within the compass and act upon the square with all mankind, for your masonry is but a dead letter if you do not habitually perform its reiterated injunctions. You may boast of its beauties, and you have just reason to do so. You may attend its lectures. You may be an enthusiast in its forms and ceremonies, but unless you reduce it to practice, unless its incitements be brought to bear upon your moral conduct, you can enjoy no advantage over those who are still in darkness, and the benefits of masonry have been extended to you in vain. Circumscribe your actions then within the boundary line of your duty to God and man, and convince the world that the system of masonry is something more than a name. End of chapter 9. Please support this channel by clicking on the links below.